I wish to register a complaint. <laughs> Hello, miss. What do you mean, miss? <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a cold. I wish to make a complaint about this parrot what I purchased not half an hour ago from this very boutique. Oh, yes, the, uh, the Norwegian blue. The Norwegian blue. <laughs> what's wrong with it? I'll tell you what's wrong with it, my lad. It's dead. That's what's wrong with it. So it is. <laughs> well. There's your money back, a couple of holiday vouchers. Thank you. <laughs> well, you can't say Thatcher hasn't changed some things. <laughs> Busting loose with some bad jokes. I feel like busting loose with some bad jokes. Uh, I feel like busting loose with some bad jokes. Oh, I feel like busting loose with some bad. Listen, a man walked into a butcher shop. He said, A pound of bacon, please. The butcher said, Lean back. He said, A pound of bacon, please. I said, Bad jokes. He said, Bad jokes. I'm talking about bad jokes. Got to have bad jokes. A man was in a hospital bed. Oh, good God. The doctor said, I've got some good news uh, and some bad news. The man said, I'll watch the bad news. And the doctor said, we've had to amputate both your legs. He said, ooh, good God. What's the good news? And the doc said, the man in the next bed wants to buy your slippers. <laughs> and let me hear you sing it. I said, bad jokes. I said, bad jokes. I'm talking about bad jokes. Got to have bad jokes. A man walked into a bar. He had a talking dog. He said, this is put the talking dog. And he can do anything that you want. The barman said, oh yeah, and he gave Butch five pounds, and he said, bring me back a paper, and don't forget the change, and Butch said, all right, because he was a talking dog, and he went out the door. Six hours later, Butch still hadn't come back, so they sent out a search party, they sent out a search party, they went looking over here, ha. they went looking over there, ha. they looked down the hallway, Butch was down there with a lady dog, and they were getting it on. Butch was getting it on. Uh, they were getting it on. Uh, Butch was getting it on. The guy said, Butch, you've never done this before. Butch said, Ha! I never had the money before. I said, Bad jokes. I said, Bad jokes. I'm talking about bad jokes. Got to have bad jokes. Take it to the bridge. A trunk went into the pub. He said, does anybody here own a six-foot penguin? Everybody said, no. He said, oh, shit, I just went over a nun. I said, bad jokes. I said, bad jokes. I'm talking about, I gotta have, I really need bad jokes. Break it down. There comes a time in a comedian set when he has to cut out the one-liners and get straight to the shaggy dog stories just like this one this one a man walked into a barber shop he said i want you to cut my hair just like michael jackson he and he fell asleep in the chair. Hey, 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 hey. When he woke up, he was completely bald. Just like this guy. He said, Baba! Baba! Michael Jackson.
looks and doesn't look like this. And the Bible said he would if he came here. Last time, sing it. I said bad jokes. I said bad jokes. I gotta have bad jokes. I think they need bad jokes. sitting down to a nice, quiet breakfast. Pull! <laughs> oh, is it my birthday again? Ah, uh, oh, the Royal Mail's arrived. Thank you, Lickbottom. Uh, uh, this one's for you, Mummy. Ooh! I wonder what it can be! Oh, and this one's addressed to Theo Cupia. Some Greek friend of yours, perhaps, Philly? No, 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 you silly souvlaki. That says the occupier. Oh, I see. Oh, me again, is it? Well, it has been for the last 36 years, damn it. Go, oh, stop oh, whinging, oh. boy, you green burk. Go on, Liz, open it. Very well. I now declare this envelope open. Ah. <laughs> what is it, Liz? Yeah. It says community charge. Oh, smashing. I like a nice game of Monopoly. Oh. <laughs> Bags, I'm the old boot. No, 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 Granny. It's the poll tax. Complete within 21 days or you get fined 50 pounds. 50 pounds? Oh, I haven't even passed go yet. <laughs> what exactly does the form say? It, it says we have to list all our other homes. What? You mean Sandringham, Windsor? Kensington Palace, Clarence House? Oh, clean me, the Oaken Road. Blimey, this is going to cost us a fortune. Ah. One could always flee the country. <laughs> Charles. Oh, sorry, just an idea, Mama. Oh, no, he's right, you know. We could all run away to Balmoral. They'd never think of making us pay the poll tax in Scotland. <laughs> I said, well, there must be wrinklies in. <laughs> when Mr. Cheese asked me um, to appear in this soiree, as we're going to have to learn to call these sort of events in 1992, uh, <laughs> when it will become compulsory to be Belgian, <laughs> I said, what sort of thing do you require from me? at such a function. And he said, jokes. Now, when I hear the word jokes, a chill hand clutches my bowels. <laughs> a warm hand nowadays is prohibitively expensive. <laughs> and... I, I don't know whether you're like me, but I'm actually joke blind. They go in one ear and out the other. Um, Specialists call it quipslexia. <laughs> I know... I know perfectly well the joke takes place in a public house. It involves a travelling salesman. He's talking to either a gorilla or a parrot. <laughs> and for the life of me, I cannot remember where the sharabang load of Ugandan nuns comes into it. <laughs> if at all. So what I'm going to do instead is to introduce some musical delight. To put something into this show that doesn't actually exist in it at all, really. Style. <laughs> Sophistication. To which I think you've always looked to me in the past. <laughs> I'm going to do something which may alarm those of a tasteful nature. I'm going to pay tribute to a man I've always associated with style and sophistication, uh, Fred Astaire. Um, <laughs> a song by... Um, Irving Berlin, I mean, you'll notice from the set, that is sophisticated, the top hat, the white tie, the tails, the gleaming white piano, the gleaming white pianist. <laughs> this is interesting, it's Picasso's cock. <laughs> How very rarely you get a chance to say that in a public place. <laughs> Mr. 
see this is back. Sometimes I wonder if I'm pregnant, and if I am, I wouldn't, wouldn't care to meet the father. <laughs> Just my sort of audience. <laughs> Deviant and pissed. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm now going to sing you top hat and white tiles. Ten tiles. <laughs> it's the machinery. Um, from the film Top Hat, written by Irving Berlin, in the manner of Mr. Fred Astaire. Thank you. <laughs> I just got an invitation through the mails. The presence requested this evening is formal, it's top hat, white tie tails. Nothing now can take the wind out of my sails. Because I'm invited to step out this evening in top hat, white tie tails. I'm putting on the top hat, tying up the white tie, putting on my tails. I'm doing up my shirt front. in the cufflinks, polishing the nails. I'm stepping out, my dear, to breathe an atmosphere that simply reeks with class. And I trust that you'll excuse my dust when I step on the gas. <laughs> this is it, is it? Not a word about trousers. <laughs> you would have imagined it would not be beyond the wit and wisdom of Irving Berlin to come up with some sort of line like, I'm slipping on my trousers. <laughs> oh, I'll be there. Taking off my top hat, muzzing up my white tie, dancing in my tail, dancing in my tail. Thank you. I'm talking tonight to Sir Arthur Grebe Streebling. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> what? No, no, you're not at all. You're, you're talking to Sir Arthur Streebling. Grebling. <laughs> you're confusing me with Sir Arthur Grebe Streebling. Right, yes. Yes, no, no, my name is Streebling. Grebling. The T is silent, as in Fox. Right, yes. <laughs> Obviously, you're confusing me with somebody else. Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, yes, quite all right. Not at all. Uh -huh. yes. I would like to ask... <laughs> I would like to ask... I would like to ask... Um, I, I would like to ask... Um, so, Arthur, something about his, his very unique restaurant, the Frog and Peach. Well, uh, this seems like an ideal opportunity, really. Yes. What with me being here and uh, you being there. Yes, indeed, yes. Wonderful opportunity. Yes, indeed. Seize it. <laughs> I, I, I certainly will. Good, uh, good. How did the idea of the frog and peach actually come to you? The idea for the frog and peach came from in the bath. <laughs> I suddenly thought to myself, where can a young couple mm. with not too much money to spend, right. feeling a bit hungry, feeling a bit peckish, where can they go and get a really big frog? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where can they go? Right. And, 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 and a nice, good, fine peach. Where can they go? And, of course, answer came then. And so on this premise, I founded the restaurant. On these premises, in fact? On these precise premises, yes. 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 I founded the frog yes. and peach. Yes. <laughs> um, how... <laughs> <laughs> how long ago uh, did you actually start this venture? God, that's a tricky one. Mm. Uh, Certainly within living memory. Oh, good. 
I believe it was shortly after World War II. Ah, yes. Do you remember that? <laughs> Absolutely ghastly business. Yes, yes. I was completely against it. I think we all were. Yes, well, I wrote a letter. Mm. <laughs> Getting back to the frog and peas. Of course, yes. Um, how has business been? Uh, let me answer that question in two parts. Business hasn't been, and there hasn't been any business. Ah. <laughs> the last 45 years have been rather a lean time for us up at the, up at the old F and P. Uh, don't you feel you're at somewhat a, a, a disadvantage being <laughs> stuck out here in the middle of a bog in the heart of the Yorkshire Moors? <laughs> I think the word disadvantage is awfully well chosen here, yes. <laughs> but I thought at the time, rightly or wrongly, possibly both, yes, <laughs> that people in this country were crying out for a restaurant without a parking problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here, in the middle of the bog, in the heart of the Yorkshire Moors, there is no problem parking the car. Right, right. A little difficulty extricating it, but... Uh, <laughs> The parking here is a joy. Yes, yes. It's a joy. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, don't you feel that you're at a slight disadvantage with regard to the menu? Have you seen it? Oh, very briefly. That's, uh, that's the only way to see it. It is... <laughs> it is so... <laughs> so, what's the word? Uh, it's down there, isn't it? <laughs> it is so limited. Limited. <laughs> limited, yes. 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 There are only two items on the menu. Yes. First of all, there is frog a la pêche. Ah. Frog a la pêche, basically a large frog, is brought to your table covered in boiling cointre with a peach stuck in its mouth. <laughs> it's one of the most disgusting sights I've ever seen. <laughs> the only alternative to frog a la pêche is even worse. Pêche a la frog. <laughs> pêche a la frog. A peach is brought to your table by the waiter, again, Covered in boiling cointre. The waiter? Very often, yes. <laughs> Very often the waiter is covered in boiling cointre. Mm. But the policy here, the policy here is to aim the cointre at the peach. Ah, yes, yes. That's the policy. Yes, yes. The peach is then sliced open to reveal 300 squiggling black tadpoles. Oh. It is the most nauseating sight I've ever seen. <laughs> Not to put you off with food. Yes. Which is a damn good thing considering what the food is like. Exactly. <laughs> Now, this is fascinating stuff, of course. Um, but I would say that the, the whole venture of the Frog and Peach has been um, a little disastrous. I, I don't think I'd choose the word disastrous here. No? I think catastrophic would be nearer the mark. <laughs> the whole thing has been a gigantic failure and a huge catastrophe. Yes, but do you feel um, that you have learned from your mistakes? Oh, certainly. Certainly, I've learned from my mistakes and I'm sure I could repeat them exactly. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Arthur, for the Street 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 Street. Street. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome everybody's favourite mother-to-be, Mrs. Tina Bishop. Oh, hello. One, two, one, two. Oh, hello. It's so nice to be asked to be a part of Amnesia International. Can... <laughs> Ken and I are just completely thrilled because we know that we're all guilty of forgetting things from time to time. It's not just the majority, it's the minority as well. And... <laughs> no, I don't... No, I don't understand. But anyway, we're very flattered because, you know, I mean, there's probably some of you out there now, you know, it's all being filmed and there's probably some who are watching it on film and thinking, oh, shit, I knew I was meant to do something that night. Because they completely forgot they were meant to be here. So this is what it's all about. I need to international to my step. <laughs> don't mock me, you bastards. I'm pregnant. I don't know. <laughs> to my stepfather in law, Kim and I, yeah, we decided to do a song dedicated to everyone that suffers from amnesia. Thank you.
Sorry, I forgot. Sorry. It's got the pictures of this month we left behind. <laughs> Morning. I'd Hello. like to have an argument, please. <laughs> right. Now, are you sure you wouldn't prefer a lengthy, moist rogery? <laughs> oh, no, just an argument, please. Right, yeah. Now, do you want the single argument, or can I offer you a course? Uh, well, what is the cost? Well, it's two pounds for a five-minute argument, but only 15 pounds for a course of ten. Oh. Well, I think I'll just take the, uh, the five minutes and see all how it goes right, from there. All, all right. right. Now, let's see who's free. Mr. Wobblebot is free, but mm. he's a bit conciliatory, oh, Mr. Wobblebot. Nice um, now, what about Mr. Nichols, room 12? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> what do you want? What? Don't give me that, you snotty faced heap of parrot dropping! What? I'll tell that side. Shut your festering gob, you tit! Your pipe makes me puke, you scrofulous, toffee-nosed, vacuous pervert! Look, look, I came here for an argument. I oh, 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 I'm sorry, this is abuse. Oh, oh I oh, see, you... oh, that explains it. Yes, you want, um, oh. 12A, it's next door. Oh, I see. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's OK, it's OK. <laughs> Stupid git. <clears throat> uh, is this the right room for an argument? I've told you once. <laughs> Uh, I know you haven't. Yes, I have. When? Just now. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. You didn't. I did. You did. I'm telling you, I did. You didn't. I'm so sorry. Is this the five-minute argument or the full half hour? Oh, uh, <laughs> just the five minutes. Just the five minutes. That's right. right. <clears throat> Thank you. Anyway, I did. You most certainly did not. Now, let's get one thing quite clear. I most definitely told you. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. 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 No, you didn't. 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 I came here for a good argument. No, you didn't. You came for an argument. An argument isn't just contradiction. Well, it can be. No, it can't. An argument is a connected series of statements intended to establish a proposition. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It isn't just contradiction. Look, if, it, if I argue with you, I must take up a contrary position. Yeah, well, it just say no, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it isn't. No, 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 it isn't. It's an intellectual process. Contradiction is just the automatic game thing of anything the other person says. No, it says. isn't. It is. It is not. Now, look. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> what? That's it. Good morning. Oh, it's just getting interesting. I'm sorry. The five minutes is up. That was never five minutes just now. I'm afraid it was. Oh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not allowed to argue anymore. 
If you want me to go on arguing, you'll have to pay for another five minutes. <laughs> Wasn't it for five minutes just now? <laughs> oh, come on. This is ridiculous. If you want me to go on arguing, you'll have to pay for another five minutes. All right. Here you are. Thank you. Well, where was? That was never five minutes. I just told you, if, if you want me to go on arguing, you'll have to pay for another five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just paid. No, you didn't. <laughs> I did. You did not. I did. You did. I did. You did. I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. You did not. I don't want to argue about it. I'm only sorry, but you didn't pay. Aha. If I didn't pay, why are you arguing? Aha. Gotcha. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. If you're arguing, I must have paid. Not necessarily. I could be arguing in my spare time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. My name is Mr. Nettleford, Trevor Nettleford. I have an inquiring mind. Cat flaps, cat flaps. What is the sense in cat flaps? <laughs> Whose idea was cat flaps? How come cats have all the flaps? <laughs> I don't have a man flap. A little spider doesn't have a little spider flap. So why do cats have the monopoly on flaps? I hate the way they come into your house through the cat flap. Looking at you, rubbing it in, as if to say, ha 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 ha! Where's your flap then? Ha! You are flapless! Take your cat and your flap and hug her up! TV shows, TV shows. Why? At the end of a TV show, does the man always say, we'll see you at the same time next week. Don't forget to tune in. If you tune in the same time next week, the program will be finished. <laughs> huh? Where is the logic in that? What kind of sense is that? <laughs> Take your TV show and horror. <laughs> Babies. Babies! I don't trust babies, I think they're up to something. <laughs> they're always creeping and crawling around. Stand up straight like normal human beings. <laughs> and they never talk to you, do they, babies? All this goo goo ga ga, speak bloody English! <laughs> I don't trust babies as far as I can throw them, and that's a pretty long bloody way. <laughs> That is why you need a babysitter. Because if you didn't have a babysitter, the minute you leave the house, they'd be on the phone ringing off a baby pizza, <laughs> dancing to Fisher Price music, <laughs> letting all their friends into the cat flap. <laughs> Take your baby and hug her off. James Bond. No, wait a second. Shag pile carpets. <laughs> Shag pile carpets. Shag pile carpets. What kind of name is shag pile carpets? <laughs> Who thought of shag pile carpets? What's next? Bunking rugs? <laughs> Fornicating placemats? I want to know. James Bond. <laughs> With no rehearsal at all. <laughs> James Bond. I don't trust James Bond. Every time you see him, he looks different. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, it blows up. He goes to China, it blows up. He goes to Russia, it blows up. He goes to Jamaica, it blows up. That's why he never goes home. If he did, it would blow up. Every time you see James Bond, he's snugging up a woman. He goes to Jamaica, he's snugging up a woman. He goes to China, he's snugging up a woman. He goes to Russia, he's snugging up a woman. And you never hear him say, where's my condoms? <laughs> Shaken, not stirred. By the way, have you got any Johnny's for the weekend? 
So there must be millions of James Bond babies all over the world. <laughs> These would be dangerous children. You put the nappy on them, it blow up. <laughs> you give them a rusk, it blow up. Them kiss grandma, she blow up. I don't want to be near these children. Anyway, they don't exist, you know why? Because every time James Bond snugs with a woman, the next time she's here, she's being shot, or strangled, or drowned. This is an extreme form of contraception. <laughs> My name is Trevor Meckleford. I am finished. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and now we'll have a uh, short a jazz interlude um, to do a piano duet with me this evening. I have a great friend of mine, Sophia Loren, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Must apologise, Mr. Roland Rivron, ladies and gentlemen. We've had to cancel a couple of perfs at the Nash to be here right. tonight. That's uh, performances of the National Theatre. Yes, indeed. We've given up a whole evening of proper acting <laughs> <laughs> to be here tonight to help you with your little entertainment singing, haven't yes. we, Adrian? Yes. Now, um, we've decided to fly in the face of comedy convention and not do a skit that John Cleese wrote 20 years ago. Yes. <laughs> a trick that was written a hundred years ago, in 1889, with the great, the great Bartholomew Spunk. Oh, a treasure of poverty and love. And an alcoholic, apparently. Oh, yes, poor sad mad Bob. Poor sad, sad <laughs> Bartholomew, yes. In fact, he, he, he performed this in front of Queen Victoria at the Braemar Highland Gathering in 1889, and so impressed was she that she gave him the royal assent to toss his caber anywhere in Persia. <laughs> now, that is a wonderful single on ton, Robin. <laughs> now, um, the trick is, in fact, entitled the William Tell Trick, in which Robin, rather incongruously, will be giving us his William. Yes. <laughs> and Adrian, by some very strange paradox, will be playing young boy with apple. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I should just point out that the, the front four rows on each side should really cover their eyes with their hands during this because it does involve the use of live bullets. That's right, it, it involves... <laughs> we, we... <laughs> we didn't use live bullets at rehearsal. No, Adrian, and everyone agreed it was rather dull. <laughs> It's a fucking trick, Robin. Yes, Adrian, and the fucking trick is not to look frightened. But these people don't want to see a trick in which I might possibly get hurt, do they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, loves. I'm not doing it. I'm sorry. No, I'll just send my two pounds to Amnesty like I normally do. I, I can't do it. It's too fucking dangerous. You just don't give a shit about Amnesty, do you? <laughs> you just thought that your helplessly flagging career <laughs> might get a little boost by being seen as the great British public as some sort of concerned actor, didn't you? <laughs> Mr. Nice Guy. It's been a long time since the young ones, Adrian, hasn't it? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Right. Now, hold still. In in incidentally, Robin, um, what, what did happen when Bartholomew Spunk did this trick? Oh, no worry. He was very ill anyway, apparently. <laughs> Well, so, so he... he got shot, yes, but the fellow who was holding the gun apparently was a notorious alcoholic who couldn't hold the gun straight. So off we go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bloody you... Nora, Robbie, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm terribly This sorry. is exactly the sort of thing Amnesty's trying to put a stop to! <laughs> I'm sorry, Adrian, I'm very sorry. It's the bright lights. Perhaps if I shielded my eyes, it might be better. No, no! Look, just don't aim for the foot, aim for the head! I mean, the I apple! Right. <laughs> aim for the apple! Hold still. Ready? Yes. Oh, fantastic! A hole straight through the middle of the apple! Look at that! <laughs> well done, Robin. Thank you very much and good night. You wiggled. You wiggled. He wiggled his head, didn't he? He did. He did. It didn't hit the apple at all. Come on, one more time. <laughs> Ready? Yes. <laughs> That'll teach him to upstage me in Hamlet, lad. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we're French and Saunders, and we're going to do something a little bit different this evening. Um, it's called improvisation. And it's very, now, some very of you... dangerous. <laughs> very dangerous. Sure. Some of you may have seen this somewhere else on television, somewhere like that. Um, for those of you that don't know, what it involves is Dawn and I making up... <laughs> a, do that in a minute when I finish. Do it in a minute when I'm I just, finish. I'm warming up. I know. Um, what it actually involves is Dawn and I making up a sketch on stage as we go along. In a minute, I'm going to ask for some help from you. I want you to shout out just some names of some famous people. We will pick two people and become those people on stage in a situation, like, for instance, steam bath, steam ship, something like that. Steam bath. Steam. Let's say steam bath for this steam evening. Bath. OK, so can you just shout out some yeah. names and we'll pick a couple? <laughs> Thank you. Claire Rayner. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right, we've got Claire Rayner and, and Linda Lovelace. Linda Lovelace. Yes. Oh. <laughs> So, Claire Rayner, Linda Lovelace, right. in a steam bath. How will right. we know exactly when to go into character, though? Because I'll clap my hands. Oh, I see. All right, so when I've clapped my hands, sorry. Yeah. When I've clapped my hands, we're in character. OK? Right. You ready? Right. Here we go. One, two, three. Uh, so, what can I ask you about Linda Lovelace? What? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Got a problem? <laughs> um, oh, I know. I know something she does. <laughs> you. <laughs> Oops. 
sorry, I didn't know she did that. You threw me then. I didn't know she did that. No, she doesn't do that. Well, what did you do it for? I made it up. <laughs> well, don't just make things up like that. That's just stupid. Don't just make things up like that. Just ruins it if you do that. I thought that's what you do another one now. You're supposed God, to. God, you're doing so well. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Can we just shout out a couple more names? We'll do another one quickly. Gloria Sorry? Hunniford. Gloria Hannaford. Gloria Hannaford and Annette Newman. Thank you. Right. Gloria Hannaford and Annette Newman. Newman. In a steam bath. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> I best be in a net, I think. <laughs> Gloria. Ready? I can't do Gloria. Ready? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not ready. I've, I've done, done it. I've done it. I'm not ready. Good. That's good, what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, I know. I know who she does. <laughs> I told you not to do that, didn't I? Yeah, but Gloria Hunniford does do that. She does she not does. do that. I have never she seen does. her do that. She, you I have, you've just ruined it again. You don't even know Gloria. She does not do I that. I know Gloria, and she does that all But you've got one more fair. chance. That's one not more fair. chance. That's really not fair. Frank Boff and Judith Chalmers in a steam bath now. All right, all right. Well, which one am I? Frank Boff. I know that! <laughs> right. Frank Boff, right. No, I'm not. I've done it. There's something just there, look. <laughs> something on the stage, isn't it? <laughs> Don't do that if you're thinking of doing that. about that, ladies and gentlemen. Complete fiasco. There's something else for you now. Sorry about that. Michelangelo to see you, your lordship. Send him in, please. <laughs> and it's your holiness. Evening, your grace. Good evening, Michelangelo. Now... <laughs> I didn't realise you were that well-known, Michelangelo. No, not Now, I want to have a word with you. About this painting of yours at the Last Supper. Oh, yes. I'm not happy with it. Oh, dear. It took hours. Not happy at all. <laughs> well, do the jellies worry you? No, no, they had a bit of colour, don't they? Oh, I know. You don't like the kangaroo. <laughs> what kangaroo? Well, I'll paint it out. It's no sweat. I never saw a kangaroo. Well, he's right at the back. You'll never notice him. But I'll paint him out. It's no problem. I'll tell you what. I'll change him into a disciple. Ah. Mm. All right, then. That's the problem. What is it? The disciples. Are they too Jewish? <laughs> I made Judas the most Jewish. No, it's just that there are 28 of them. <laughs> well, another one will hardly notice them, will it? Right? So I'll make the kangaroo no, into a no, disciple. No, 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 no. All right, I'll lose the kangaroo altogether. God, I don't Look, mind. That's not the point. There are 28 disciples. Too many? Well, of course it's too many. Well, yes, in a way. But I wanted to give the impression of a huge get-together. You know, a real Last Supper. Not any old supper, but a real proper final treat. A real mother of a blowout. But there were 12 disciples and our Lord at the Last Supper. The Bible clearly says so. What, no friends? No friends. Aha! Waiters? No. A cabaret? No. But I like them, you see. They fill out the canvas. I mean, I suppose at a pinch we can lose three Look, or four. Look, there were 12 disciples and our Lord... I've got it, I've got it. We'll call it the penultimate supper. <laughs> what? Well, I must 
must have been one. If there was a last one, there must have been one before that, right? Yes. So this is the penultimate supper. The Bible doesn't say how many people are duck, does it? No, it doesn't. Well, there you go, then. Look, the Last Supper is a significant event in the life of our Lord. The penultimate Ooh. supper was not. Even if they had a mariachi band and a conjurer. <laughs> now, a Last Supper I commissioned from you, and a Last Supper I want with 12 disciples and one Christ. One? Yes, one. <laughs> now, will you please tell me what in heaven's name possessed you to paint this with three Christs in it? It works, mate! It does not work! It does! It looks great! The two skinny ones balance out the fat ones! <laughs> there was only one saviour! Well, I know that, everyone knows that, but what about a bit of artistic license? One redeemer! I'll tell you what you want, mate! You want a bloody photographer, not a creative painter with a bit of imagination. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I want. I want a Last Supper with 12 disciples, one Christ, no marsupials, no limbo dancers, <laughs> by Thursday lunch, or you don't get paid, bloody fascist. <laughs> I'm the bloody Pope I am. <laughs> May not know much about art, but I know what I like. <laughs> Bedtime story tonight comes from the prolific pen of Captain W.E. Johns. It's one of the later Biggles books. It's called Biggles Goes to See Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> 1976. Biggles was tired. He lit a cigarette and exhaled slowly and thoughtfully. He gave a little cough. Then a slightly bigger cough. Then an enormous, roomy, wheezing wrench of a cough which nearly flung him off his chair. <laughs> he gasped for one brief, gravelly intake of breath but was cut short by a retching, racking, heaving, spume-ridden roar that seemed to split his chest like a sledgehammer. Ah, <laughs> oh, that was better. <laughs> Suddenly, the rough wooden door of E-Hut was pushed aside and Algy entered, brandishing a newspaper. He was clearly very stoned. He climbed up onto Biggles' desk and began dancing provocatively. <laughs> hey, Algy, for belly, heck's sake, watch out for those meteorological charts, cried Biggles. Hey, man, I'm so happy, warbled Algy, his fleshy white body cavorting crazily in the flickering, flickering light of Biggles' hurricane lamp. <laughs> look, man, look, grinned Algy jabbing his finger at a copy of the Midshire Advertiser. Biggles' eye was drawn to a large advert beneath an article by Paul Johnson called Lighting Fires with Communists. <laughs> Finally, Midshire is ready for Bruce Springsteen, he read. Who the bally heck is Bruce Springsteen, queried Biggles testily. Who is Bruce Springsteen? Where have you been all these years, man? Under a rock? Biggles hated Algy when he was like that. <laughs> he would talk all hip and come out with silly suggestions like getting Bob Marley to play the Royal Tournament. <laughs> On this particular day, Squadron Leader Bigglesworth was in no mood for Algy's little games. Look, Algy, go and lie down. We've got some heavy flying tomorrow. Biggles' remarks seemed to send Algy into paroxysms of helpless laughter. And he fell back against the wall, grabbing at Biggles' huge, we rule it map of the world. A crack appeared just outside Barcelona and running across Europe, down through the Caucasus. It was accelerating into southern Assam when Algy toppled helplessly off the filing cabinet and onto the floor. He lay there shaking, the southern hemisphere draped across his stomach. <laughs> oh, that's good, man. That is so good. <laughs> oh, you're beautiful, man. Biggles could stand it no longer. In a couple of strides, he was beside Algy. Well, actually, he was a little beyond him. One stride would probably be enough in that small room. He turned and took half a stride back. <laughs> but that took him too far the other way. <laughs> and when he bent down, he couldn't quite reach Algy. So he stood up and went back to where he'd originally started from. And this time took only one stride. It brought him right up beside Algy. In fact, a little too close this time. <laughs> He'd overcompensated, and now he could hardly bend down at all. He took half a stride back and tried again. 
This time he found himself in quite an interesting position astride out his body. <laughs> the rough wooden door of E Hut was suddenly pushed aside and Ginger entered. Oh, I'm sorry, Biggles. He declared quickly. No, 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 come in, old chap, you can help me. He motioned him to a chair. Biggles sat down and lit a cigarette. Well, spill the gin, Ginger. He drew heavily on the thin blue smoke. Bruce Springsteen's coming to the Midshire Odeon, sir. <laughs> Biggles exhaled slowly. He coughed. <laughs> Involuntarily at first, then with a quick throat-clearing rumble, which developed into an uncontrollable, shattering, rasping, sepulchral rattle of mucus and phlegm, which nearly turned his lungs inside out. Oh, God, what a cough! The Midshire Odeon had never seen anything like it. Their previous highest attendance had been ten. <laughs> when Michael Dennison and Dulcie Gray toured in 1927, with the Arthur Spendlove partially nude aerial ballet, <laughs> who were arrested during the performance. <laughs> I'm so belly excited I can hardly keep this kite on course, shouted Algie, as the twin engine Hilton Morgan biplane headed for Midshire International Airport. <laughs> Ginger was. Have you got the dressing room key again? No. Come on, now? come on. Yes, now. Oh, come on. One of the Pythons... Ginger! <laughs> Ginger was reading. Born to Run is a work of complete and unadulterated genius. It makes the Sistine Chapel look like the toilets at Millwall Football Club. <laughs> He had in his hands a huge book called 6,423 Wonderful Things about Bruce Springsteen. And he was navigating with his feet. <laughs> Suddenly, Ginger lowered his book and the trace of anxiety crept into his otherwise quite unanxious voice. You have got the tickets, haven't you, Algie? Sure thing, Ginger! I've tucked them into my flying suit where no one will find them! Shouted Algie above the roar of the 217 horsepower Spenger and Cottesford single cam engine. Ginger grimaced. Algie always put the tickets down there. And though they were safe, they were nasty and sweaty by the time he got to the concert. <laughs> I say, Algie, he shouted, do you think I could have my ticket now? OK, I'll have a go, bellowed Algie. And leaning back, he began to undo his flying costume. Biggles looked up in alarm. Put it away, Algie, for God's sake. <laughs> Just looking for the belly tickets, old bean, reassured Algie. Biggles ruminated on how much nicer Algie was when he talked like that. When suddenly Algy turned, a dawning look of horror settling across his handsome... Thank you, love. John. <laughs> Goes back a long way. Um, <laughs> well, not that far. <laughs> About halfway. Anyway. Um, A dawning look of horror settled across his handsome, non-spotty features. That's Algie, who I was talking about in a minute before. <laughs> Keys were thrown on by my um, room partner. <laughs> Chum. Oh, shit! Conjectured Algie. Wash your mouth out! Ordered Biggles, dropping his sewing. Shit! <laughs> Repeated Algie. They're gone! The fucking tickets have gone! Biggles slapped Algie hard across the face. Don't you dare use language like that aboard this twin-engine Hilton Morgan biplane. <laughs> Algie turned and gave Biggles six left jabs and a swinging right to the jaw. <laughs> Biggles hurtled towards the back of the plane, hit his head a glancing blow on the first aid kit and slumped into unconsciousness. I gotta see Bruce, screamed Ginger hysterically. I gotta see him. I gotta see the rock sensation of the 70s. I'm gonna jump. Don't be a fool, yelled Algie. There's only one parachute. And I'm wearing it, roared Ginger in triumph, pushing Algie aside and hurling himself out of the plane. No, you're not! <laughs> Screamed Algie above the roar of the seven horsepower engines. Ginger paused in mid-fall. <laughs> Algie was right. What he had thought was the parachute ripcord was only his hearing aid. <laughs> he pulled it, hopefully, but it just came out of his ear. I'm coming after you. We'll get to see Springsteen, yelled Algie, as he clambered out of the plane and dropped towards Ginger. Don't forget the parachute, screamed the accelerating Ginger. Oh, shit! <laughs> Ejaculated Algie. 
When Biggles came round, he realised he was the only one left on the plane. He grabbed himself, he grabbed himself the joystick and eased himself behind the controls. He looked down at the frozen countryside below him. Algy and Ginger were awfully close to the field. It was a pity, really, he'd like them both. But what were two rather stock fictional characters compared to the greatest white musical talent to emerge in America this decade? Big old set course, north, northeast for Midshire. It was 8.30. The concert should have started at 8, but Big old knew the roadies would still be bringing the guitars on. He settled into his seat and smiled to himself as he felt the cool, crisp assurance of the two front circle tickets and the lining of his old flying jacket. Finally, Biggles was ready for Bruce Springsteen. Thank you. The lowest common denominator of the capitalists is greed. The lowest common denominator of the communists is ignorance. The lowest common denominator of the Republicans is Dan Quayle. <laughs> I got the Democratic Party against me. Is that all? I've got the SDP, the SLD, and the Labour Party against me. Ah, it must be nice to run a country where there's no organized opposition. <laughs> our industry is so advanced, it's a threat to the environment. I wish our industry was advanced enough to be a threat to the environment. <laughs> I'm going to sell off the environment to Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> Our security services are trained at Harvard and West Point. Ours are trained at Eton and Cambridge. What a lot we have in common. <laughs> when Gorbachev visited the United States, we gave him caviar to make him feel at home. When Gorbachev visited Britain, we gave him vodka to make him feel at home. When Mrs. Thatcher visited Poland, we closed down the shipyard to make her feel at home. <laughs> ah, Terry, Terry. Come in, come in. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, do you know why I've sent for you, Terry? <coughs> uh, not really, sir, no, no. Not really, not really. Well, um, Terry, first of all, congratulations on winning the School Poetry Prize. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Drip tells me that it is the most mature and exciting poem he has ever received from a pupil. Don't suck your thumb, boy. <laughs> I'm not, sir. No, that was just a piece of general advice for the future. <laughs> now, um, Terry. Terry, 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 Terence, Terence. It's um, about this poem, really. Uh, I read it, Terry. I can't pretend to be much of a judge of literature. I'm an English teacher, not a homosexual, but I have to say <laughs> it worried me. Oh? Yes, worried me. I have it here, in fact. Um, uh, inked ravens of despair claw holes in the arse of the world's mind. I mean, what kind of a title for a poem is that? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's my title, sir. Inked ravens of despair claw holes in the arse of the world's mind. I mean, you sickening for something? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I think that's what the poem explores. Oh, it explores, does it? I see. Explores. Right, well, let's have a look at this, then. Uh, Scrutal threats unhorse a question of flowers. I mean, is it a girl? Is that the problem? Well, it's not something I can explain, so, you know, it's all, it's all in the poem. It certainly is all in the poem. Uh, I asked for answers and got a head full of heroin in return. Now, Terry, listen to me. Who has been giving you heroin? <laughs> no one, sir. No, no, Terry, I must insist, it's in the poem. I got a head full of heroin in return. This is a police matter, Terry, you must tell me. Sir, no one has given me heroin. Oh, I see. So this poem is just a fiction. Is it a fantasy, a lie? What's happening? No, no, it's all true. It's autobiographical. Well, then, Terry, I must insist you tell me. No, it's a, it's a metaphor. Metaphor? How metaphor? It means I came to school to learn, but all I got was junk instead of answers. <laughs> junk? The, the GCSE syllabus is most rigidly adhered to in well, every... you know, it's... <laughs> It's just an opinion. I see. And is this just an opinion, too? Um, 
uh, when time fell wanking to the floor, <laughs> they kicked his teeth. Time fell wank. I mean, is it just put in a shop? Uh, I mean, what does time fell wanking to the floor? What does it mean? It's a, it's a quotation. Quotation? Quotation? Who from? It's not Milton, and I'm pretty sure it can't be Wordsworth. It's, it's Bowie. Bowie? Bowie? David Bowie. Oh! Oh, and is this David Bowie too? Um, my body disgusts. Damp grease wafts sweat balls from sweat balls and thigh fungus. I mean, do you what? <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Well, then why does your body disgust you? It looks perfectly all right to me. Why can't you write about meadows or something? Never seen a meadow. Well, what do you think the imagination is for? Hmm? Uh, a girl strips in my mind, squeezes my last pumping drop of hope, and rolls me over to sleep alone. You're 15 years old, Terry. What's going on? Well, yeah, I think that's what the poem... Explores, yes, don't yeah. tell me. I, I don't understand anymore. I don't understand. Well, so you, you were young once. Yeah, in a sense, yes. Well, did you ever feel like that? You mean, did I want to fireball the dead cities of the mind and watch the skin peel and warp? And thankfully, I can say no, I did not. I might have been unhappy from time to time if I broke my penknife or lost my stamp album. I certainly didn't write it down and show it to people. Perhaps it might have been better if you had. Oh, might it? Oh, might it, young Terry? I suppose I am one of the unhappy bubbles of anal wind popping and winking in the mortal bath, am I? Oh, I see your silence tells me everything. I am. I am an unhappy bubble of anal wind. Well, you know, that, that, that's just how I see it. That's valid. Valid? You're not talking about a banknote. You're calling your headmaster an unhappy bubble of anal wind. Well, well, I'm one too. Oh, well, as long as we're all unhappy bubbles of anal wind popping and winking in the mortal bath, then I suppose there's no problem. But I don't propose to advertise the fact to parents. If this is poetry, then every lavatory wall in England is an anthology. I mean, what's happened to the Oxford Book of English Verse? Where's that in all this? Hmm? Perhaps that's the lavatory paper. <laughs> is that clever? I don't know. I suppose it's another quotation from Derek Bowie, is it? <laughs> don't understand anymore. I do not understand. Well, it's not surprising, sir. You know, you're frustrated, perhaps. Oh, it's, a, it's a lonely job. You're right, I am frustrated. It is a lonely job. I'm assailed by doubt and racked by fear. Yeah, well, well, then write it down. Hmm? Write it down. Get it out of your system. You assailed see? by doubt. Racked by fear. Yes. Yes, assailed by doubt. Racked by fear. Uh, tossed in erect mucus foam. Of, of... Hatred? Good, good. What about steamed loathing? Better. You're a natural. Excellent. Steamed loathing. Snot trails of lust <laughs> perforate the bowels of my intent. Is there life on Mars, Major Tom? Put on your red shoes and dance the flunky, my china girl. Red baboon, this is blind mullet. <laughs> Red baboon, this is blind mullet. Red, hello? Hello, is that special branch? <laughs> yeah, I was trying to contact a Red baboon, actually. N no, I don't know the extension. Um, <laughs> could you look it up? Nothing unto Red Baboon, no. Um, <laughs> could you try Derek? <laughs> uh, obviously, for security reasons, we don't use last names here. Would you? Thank you. <clears throat> Derek in catering? No, I don't think that would be him. <laughs> Derek in records? No. Derek the secret agent? Yes, that would probably be him. Yes. <laughs> well, well could, could you page him in the bar? Thank you. Red baboon, this is blind mullet. Red baboon, yes, this is blind mullet. Bl Trevor, the new bloke from Pearly. <laughs> yes. Well, um, daybreak found me in position in the suspect's front garden. Oh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the camouflage outfit was an absolute stroke of genius on your part. From, from my vantage point behind the rockery, I could keep an eye on his every move, while at the same time blending effortlessly in with my herbaceous environment. 
Yes, but at that point, uh, as these anarchists are notoriously prone to do, uh, our man did the unexpected. Well, Derek, he went out. <laughs> yes, and at that point, my fiendishly clever disguise became something less of a help and, I must say, more of a hindrance, to be honest. <laughs> well, um, from the point of view of being the only man dressed as a tree on the district line, Derek... <laughs> Well, there then, there then followed a, a nightmarish journey across the park on what I must say appeared to me to be National Rottweiler Incontinence Day. <laughs> and he then joined forces with a whole crowd of subversives who seemed to have gathered for an event. And that's where I am now. I found a quiet place to speak to you unobserved. <clears throat> Derek? Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> no, I'm not being paranoid. They really are looking at me. <laughs> uh, I think you'd better get over here right away. I will try and keep their attention occupied, OK? Hello! <laughs> I know that um, appearances are against me, but I'm not a secret uh, uh, civil servant. <laughs> I'm just like the rest of you, a uh, communist. <laughs> And, uh, and a homosexual, probably. <laughs> How well I remember that first day when I first succumbed to the lures of Janus. It was um, during my medical, as it happens. I suddenly found myself overwhelmed by a great surge of emotion for the doctor. Went home and found myself pining by the phone. <laughs> Lost my appetite. Couldn't stop thinking about the man. And suddenly, it occurred to me. My God, you're a latent homosexual. <laughs> well, I thought, better latent than never. <laughs> and under the pretext of a fraudulent hemorrhoidal attack, I made a second appointment. I went back for another examination as he probed the most intimate recesses of my body. I was in seventh heaven when suddenly the doctor said, Jesus Christ! I said, what is it? He said, hold still. <clears throat> He said, you've got a, a dozen red, long-stemmed roses up your bum. <laughs> I said, read the card, read the card. <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> oh, Derek, these, these are the people I... What are you doing? These are the people I was telling you about. Acting company of the National Theatre of Brent. Excuse me. Um, before we get cracking on our main bit, I'd like to say a few off-the-cuff words about my dear friend and employer. Him to whom... Him... Him to whom... Hum, him to whom... Him to whom humility is but a second nature. Indeed, and in fact, his profound modesty it is that prevents him acknowledging international acclaim as one of the leading experiments of world theatre. Experiments, was. Pardon? Exponents. Oh, I get it. One of the leading exponents of world theatre. Exponents. Exponents. Sorry, Desmond, I couldn't read your writing in there. Very good, Wallace. Thank you. All right, cut to the end now. Good. Wind it up. Right, ladies and gentlemen, Desmond Olivier Dingle. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Travel with us now, back down the misty corridors of time, through the swing doors of historical imagining. As we take you back to the ancient world of pagan Rome, as Wallace and myself present for you a simulation of a Roman galley enacted entirely by the audience. Now listen to me, please. The rowing is really very, very simple. We're going to now practice with the oar, taking the oar up in both hands. <laughs> Take the oar in both hands, please. And then we lift the oar up to our chest. Up. <laughs> no, not you, circles. <laughs> I'm coming to you in a moment. <laughs> 
Now, you'll notice they look rather like a herd of rabbits. <laughs> but this is exactly as it would have looked at the time. <laughs> now, your oars are very, very similar to a rowing boat oars. Apart from the fact that these are 120 foot long, <laughs> and weigh four and a half tons. <laughs> now, with Wallace, please, we're going to practice. We're going to practice rowing of the Roman galley. Lean forward in your seats and push the oar away. Push! <laughs> push. And lean back in your seats. Pull! Pulling the oar towards you. And push. push. And pull. 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 And pull. Push. Pull. pull. A little bit faster one. Push. Pull. Push. 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 The upper or cheaper circle. Thank you. Now, your job is not to row the galley. You are Roman passengers. And your job is to hurl abuse <laughs> down on the galley slaves who are mainly left-wing troublemakers and poets and so forth. <laughs> and now, we return to the bowels of the vessel. <laughs> You'll pardon the expression. And here are the tragic and cringing comments of the galley slaves toiling below. <laughs> All right, standing by, please, holding the oars up, ready with your abusive Roman comments, <laughs> and with the authentic Roman rowing music, please. Push! Pull! Push! Pass down! Pass down! You're not growing fast enough! Faster! Faster! More abuse! Come on, circles! Mr. Hilton. Yes? You are the owner and sole proprietor of the Wizzo Chocolate Company. I might be. Constable Parrot and I are from the Hygiene Squad. <clears throat> We'd like a word with you about your box of chocolates entitled the Wizzo Quality Assortment. Oh, yes. To begin at the very beginning, first of all, there is the cherry fondue. This is extremely nasty, but we can't prosecute you for that. That's very true. Next, there's number four. Crunchy frog. <laughs> Am I right in thinking there's a real frog in here? A little one? What sort of frog? A dead frog. Is it cooked? No. What, raw frog? We use only the finest baby frogs. Dew picked, flown from Iraq, cleansed in finest Highland Spring water, lightly killed, and then sealed in a succulent Swiss. Quintuple smooth, full cream, triple milk chocolate envelope, and lovingly dusted with glucose. Well, don't you even take the bones out? If we took the bones out, it wouldn't be crunchy, would it? <laughs> Will you excuse me for a moment, please? Good. It says quite clearly on the box, crunchy frog. Look, the general public will not be expecting a real frog to be in this chocolate. The constable thought it was an almond whirl. <laughs> People are bound to think it's some kind of mock frog. Mock frog? Mock frog? How dare you? There are absolutely no artificial flavourings or additives in our products whatsoever. <laughs> Nevertheless, I advise you in future to replace the words crunchy frog with the legend crunchy raw unbound real dead frog if you wish to avoid prosecution. What about my sales? I have no interest in your sales. I have to protect the public. Now, <laughs> yeah. what about this next one? It was number five, wasn't it, Constable? 
Yes, number five, Ram's Bladder Cup. Ah. <laughs> what kind of confection is this? We use only the choicest juicy chunks of fresh Cornish ram's bladder, emptied, steamed, flavoured with sesame seeds, whipped into a fondue, and garnished with wax vomit. That doesn't say anything about wax vomit here. Yes, it does, just besides sodium benzoate. <laughs> well, I hardly think this is good enough. I think it would be more appropriate if the box bore a large red label. Warning! Yuck! Wax uh, vomit! <laughs> I think our sales might well plummet. Well, why don't you move into more conventional areas of confectionery like Freyline and Lime Cream, a very popular flavour I'm led to understand, or Strawberry Delight. I mean, look at these, look at these, look at these. I'll say it three times. <laughs> Cockroach Cluster. <laughs> Phlegm Cream. That's the wife's favourite. Anthrax Ripple. <laughs> What's all this about spring surprise? Oh, that's the creme de la creme. That's our speciality. You just pop the wee chalk in your mouth and two steel bolts spring out and pierce both cheeks. <laughs> pierce both cheeks? Where's the pleasure of that? Well, watching, of course. <laughs> this is an inadequate description of the sweet meat. I shall have to ask you to accompany me to the station. It's a fair cop. And don't talk to the camera. Constable, would you uh, deliver the punchline, please? You should tell him. <laughs> it's just weird. Uh, Miss Rigby, Stella, my love, would you send in the next auditioner, please? Thank you, babe. <laughs> Bye, darling. Oh. Mr. Spigot, is it not? Uh, yes, Spigot by name, Spigot by nature. Oh, <laughs> settle down. Oh, yes, all right. All right. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Uh, Mr. Spigot, you are auditioning, are you not, for the role of Tarzan? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Spigot, I couldn't help noticing almost immediately <laughs> that you are a one-legged man. Oh, you noticed that? When you've been in the business as long as I have, Mr. Spigot, <laughs> you get to notice these little things. Almost instinctively. Yeah, well, we're bound to. Yes, you, you're yeah. bound to. <laughs> now, Mr. Spigot, you, a one-legged man, are applying for the role of Tarzan. Yes, right. A role traditionally associated with a two-legged <laughs> artiste. Uh, 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 yes. And yet you, a uni dexter, <laughs> are applying for the role. Yes, that's right, yes. A role for which two legs would seem to be the minimum requirement. <laughs> well, Mr. Spigot, need I point out to you with undue emphasis where your deficiency lies as regards landing the role? Uh, yes, yes, I think you ought to. Perhaps yes. I ought, yes, yes, perhaps I ought. Need I say with too much stress that it is in the leg division <laughs> that you are deficient? Oh, the leg division? The leg division, ah. Mr. Spigot. You are deficient in the leg division to the tune of one. <laughs> Your right leg, I like. Ah. <laughs> it's a lovely leg for the role. As soon as I saw it come in, I said, hello. <laughs> what a lovely leg for the role. I've got nothing against your right leg. Ah. The trouble is, neither have you. <laughs> you, uh, you fall down on the left. You mean it's inadequate? It is inadequate, Mr. Smith. Yes, and yes. in my view, the public is not yet ready for the sight of a one-legged Tarzan swinging through the jungly tendrils, shouting, Hello, Jane. Right, yes. However great the charm of the performer be, <coughs> they are not ready for it. Mind you, you score over a man with no legs at all. Oh. If a legless man came in here demanding... <laughs> a legless man came in here demanding the role, I'd have no hesitation in saying, go away, off, off. <laughs> so there's still hope? Yes, there is still hope, Mr. Spigot. If we get no two-legged artists in here within, say, the next 18 months, there is every chance that you, a unidexter, are the very type of artiste we shall be attempting to contact at this agency. Oh, thank you, Dave. I'm sorry I can't be more definite. Oh, but good you must Lord, understand Dave. with the channel tunnel oh, going ahead. Yes. So what we're going thank to you do so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you, Amnesty, for inviting me to do this gig. Let's face it, after doing Wogan, I need all the credibility I can get. <laughs> but you get to thinking serious issues when you do a program like that. You know, you have to start thinking about the world. I wanted to do one about the environment, because we're all depressed about the environment at the moment, and I, I, I see little hope in some ways, because how can we look after the world if we can't even look after our own bodies? We can't even develop foresight about our own experiences, you know? I mean, take drinking, for instance. Most people like a drink, and they equate drinking with having a good time. They think, have a drink, have a good time. I'm going to get pissed, I'll have a good time. I'll pass me exams, I'll get pissed. I've got a new job, I'll get pissed. I'm going to have a really, really good time. So, the next time it's midnight and you're kneeling in a bathroom, face down the toilet, dressed really trying to be sick, remind yourself what a good time you're having, eh? Oh, this is marvellous, this is. This only cost me 15 pounds. <laughs> Desperately trying to connect your fingers with that little flap of flesh that hangs at the back of your neck. That's God's sick trigger, that is. A, it's a marvellous bit of the anatomy, fantastic. You touch it, wallop, there you go. It serves no other policy, it has got no other point. It is a sick trigger, wonderful thing. But why is it got to be out of reach? It could be on the end of your nose, couldn't it? It'd be all right, wouldn't it? No messing around, 15 bites of lager, click, wallop. I'm off to bed, fair enough. Instead, it's half an hour probing with a teaspoon. What's that about? How can we protect the world? We don't understand ourselves, our own bodies. The body is a highly sensitive piece of nat natural engineering. It is a highly complex machine. You should respect it. I mean, you wouldn't pour seven pints of lager in your stereo, would you? <laughs> you wouldn't buy a camera that spent every New Year's Eve unconscious on the toilet floor. <laughs> Bloody old body bollocks. Not going to live forever, am I? Come on, here we go. Of course I can drive. Wallet, what's that, an old lady? Who cares? <laughs> People have got to learn. 
don't know. I mean, you live in a strange, strange reversed world when you're drunk. A strange parallel universe where good is bad and bad is good. What a fantastic night we had last night, eh? It was brilliant. We could not walk. <laughs> we couldn't talk. It was marvellous. You get the same effect when you break your spine. <laughs> Throw yourself under a bus. It's a lot cheaper. Lasts forever. You've got to get out of it. Right, it's a drug. I mean, it's all right taking a mic, but it is a drug. Booze is like any other drug. I can't get off it. I tried cold turkey. It didn't work. Too pissed to keep it down. <laughs> oh, the urgent audience, the first pun, gets a smattering of applause. Love it to death. So, there we were, you see. Having a go at the hand that feeds it. Brave stuff. Oh, dangerous tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to bring down the government. No question at all there. So, you get a terrible thing about being drunk, because there's no face that's good. The drinking's no good. The throwing up's no good. The hangover. You get no sympathy. It's the only illness where you get no sympathy. You're poisoned, but you get no sympathy. You brung it on yourself, you never had to do it. I've got no sympathy. You brung it on yourself, you never had to do it. Well, what about the hang glider who breaks his or her legs jumping off a cliff, eh? Does anyone force them to entrust their lives to a sheet of polythene? No, but they get plenty of sympathy when they're pureed on the rocks below, don't they? I'd say you never had to do it, you stupid basket. Should have been down the pub with me. I've got a headache. You go flipping walk. <laughs> you see the world. It's full of useless things. We're consuming our environment in order to have things we don't need, the things we don't want. I mean, my fridge is the most useless thing in my life. Not just because it's got CFCs in the back. You know that, your friendly old fridge. It's going to kill you one day. When you trash it, all the CFCs float up into the environment where you get skin cancer. That's nice. Your little fridge with the rubber carrots stuck on for the kiddies, that's going to kill you. My fridge is entirely useless. I pay 24 hours worth of electricity every day so that when I open the door, it will light up my face. <laughs> there is never any food in my fridge. I buy plenty of food. I always seem to be down the shops. I spend 25 quid. I've got no food in here. Where's the food? I think my fridge is eating my food. <laughs> it eats my food and then wets itself. <laughs> it hates me, my fridge. You think, mm, 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 I've eaten his food, think I'll piss on his floor. <laughs> There's never any food in the house, and you can never buy food when you want it. When are they going to have an open all night shops around the town? That's when they don't want shops open on a Sunday. You want them open in the middle of the night. That's when you need food. After a few pints of lager, that's when you'll eat anything. Go home, there's nothing in the fridge, there's nothing to eat. I'm pissed, I've got to eat something, must be something. Always ends up the same. Corn flakes <laughs> with water. Because <laughs> it's slightly preferable to squeezing a tube of neat tomato puree down your neck. <laughs> When they're pissed, anything. I mean, why do you think Kentucky Fried Chicken stay open all night? Be honest. <laughs> I mean, what's that about? What's about? They, give you, they give you a lemon clean-up square. That's nice, isn't it? A lemon clean-up square. It's scarcely adequate when you're throwing it up on a carpet, is it, eh? <laughs> Bit of mine, Rowan Atkinson, love it to death. No, they should give you a bucket, shouldn't they? Maybe that's what the party buckets are for. <laughs> Eat the chicken, throw up in a bucket. Very convenient. <laughs> I'll tell you why they give you a lemon clean-up square, because it's the only edible thing in a fucking box. <laughs> Fast food. The world we've been conquered. We've given up our culture, ladies and gentlemen. Across the world, cultures and civilizations, languages that have stood for myriad civilizations, they've been destroyed in a decade. Napoleon could not hold Moscow. Ronald McDonald just danced him. <laughs> Richard the Lionheart was stopped at the gates of Jerusalem. Ronald McDonald, no problem, in he goes. Fast food, it's got to get faster. Nobody's got any work. No one's got anything to do. The one last pleasure is eating. Make it fast, make it fast. Get them out of the restaurant. Have them lovely plastic shiny seats shaped like ski slopes. Burp once, wallop, you're under the table. Fast food, I don't know why they don't just flush it straight down the toilet. Cut out the middleman, eh? That'd speed things up, wouldn't it? You go in your local Big Mac Whopper McDog Burger, uh, flushes a couple of Big Mac and fries down the toilet, will you, John? Make it quick, I've got a bus to catch. He says, sorry, sir, no can do. The YouTube blocked up with diced gherkin. What they put that gherkin in, eh? Everyone lifts the lid off, takes it out and puts it on a table, some other bastard puts her elbow in it. The YouTube's block, he says, we're only serving liquids. Have you seen fast food versions of liquids? A triple thick shake? A liquid? You need an industrial suction pump to get it up the straw. <laughs> Everybody sucks at once, the windows the shop came in. <laughs> what are we doing to our children, our environment? The kids drinking this damn thing, his intestines are going, no, not again, it took two years to digest the last one. <laughs> but when you're drunk, oh, I could just fancy a McDonald's. Well, oh, God, I wish I hadn't done that. 
You get home, you've got to eat something. There's no McDonald's. They were closed. The Kentucky was full of yobs, and you respect their right to be yobs, but you don't want to go in there while they're being it. And here you go. There's nothing to eat. There's no cornflakes. Ah! Suddenly, that casserole dish you put in the soak a month ago looks like a culinary delight. Oh, I'll just get a knife and chip all that crispy bits off. Oh, look at him. Crisp, oh, lovely crispy bits. Ah, you don't realise you're so pissed. You've done this three nights in a row. You got through to the enamel. People will eat anything when they're drunk. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, if there's any young parents out there in the audience tonight who've got little kids who won't eat their food, get them pissed. <laughs> little Johnny, three years old, couple of vodkas, fuck me, those Brussels sprouts look nice. <laughs> I mean, all right. You've got to put up with him lying face down in a bathroom in a puddle of vomit singing, maybe it's because I'm a Londoner, huh? but he's eating his greens. So many useless things in the world. My fridge, I'm talking about that. Those telephones. I remember in the old days, before they sold off telecom, it was marvellous. Them telephones used to, used to be one shape. Now there's any shape and size. It's got confusing. Do you remember how in the old days, if you heard a ringing in your sitting room, you knew what you had to look for, didn't you? The big telephone shaped lump of plastic. These days, it could be anything. I'm picking up the toaster, listening to the cat. They've got Mickey Mouse shaped phones, Snoopy shaped phones. It's a serious instrument. We don't need all these trashy, non biodegradable bits of plastic nobody fucking wants. I mean, what a Snoopy shaped phone. How are you supposed to take it seriously? You're having a business conversation, you're talking to Snoopy's bollocks. <laughs> all this selling off for the private stuff. I, I actually think perhaps the most useless thing of all is the advertising industry. They are excelling themselves at the moment. Oh, they're advertising all the new electricity companies, Power Gen, and telling us our wonderful streak of lightning. Power Gen is marvellous. I mean, what are they trying to tell us? We're supposed to read the advert and go, oh, I bet that's just fucking good. I'll switch on another light, you know. <laughs> I mean, what's the idea? Power Gen are promising they're going to have the cheapest, the most efficient, and the cheapest form of electricity. Well, frankly, I think it might be a little bit cheaper if there wasn't a private company making a profit out of it, but perhaps I'll be an old-fashioned, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, out of the people, a little bit of politics. Dangerous night tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, do not trust the advertising industry. No, they do not have a good track record. They have no morals. They have no principles. No. Do you know that up until recently, it was against the rules of the advertising standards to advertise on the telly tampons? <laughs> That's nice, isn't it? What an enlightened bit of legislation. What were they doing in Parliament when they thought that one up? Were they thinking, well, what should we do today? Uh, put the unemployed back to work, feed the third world? No, let's have a rule about advertising tampons. <laughs> now... We can have tampon adverts. We're all grown up and squiggly and we can have tampon adverts. Only on Channel 4 and as an experiment a couple of years ago, because of course you've got to have O-levels to understand the stark reality of menstruation, you know. You've got to have the tampon ads on the telly on Channel 4 in the middle of the Polish film so no fucker watches them, you know, because it really, it really mess up Bruce's big night, wouldn't it? A tampon ad in the middle of it. You don't want that on Channel 1. I saw this ad. I saw it, I could not believe it. When they were experimenting with tampon ads, it started with this woman. She was, she was lovely. Oh, she was so pretty. She was a lovely blonde, pretty woman. She was all pretty and lovely. Because that's a relief, isn't it, girls? Pretty girls have periods too. Quite a bit you're relieving. <laughs> and she's feeling all, she's in this advert. It's true, she's looking through her diary and she's reading all her letters, which are all feminine and they're all done up in a little pink bow and there's a bit of gloss on her filter and she's all blonde and pretty. And she's feeling all wistful. She's kind of got a little, little thoughts in her mind about love and being a girly and all feminine and gooey and squidgy and moist and lovely and wistful. She's going all sort of soft and drippy and wistful. Well, that's exactly how you feel when you have your periods, isn't it, girls, eh? <laughs> Never mind stomach cramps. Fuck me, I'm feeling wistful. I'm not feeling... <laughs> for work today. I'm feeling a bit wistful. All right. <laughs> if you don't do your share of the washing up, I'm feeling so wistful, I'll knife you. <laughs> Pre-wistful tension. <laughs> On comes the voiceover. I kid you not for the brand name. The voiceover is a lovely voice. It goes, ladies. <laughs> ladies. Yeah, because ladies have periods as well. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Felicity Kendall, the Queen. Yeah, they do, yeah. People think, hang on, it's going too far. So we like about the Queen, but leave Felicity Kendall out of this. All right. <laughs> He goes, ladies, do you have a secret? Ah! Half the population of the world do it every month. What's the secret about that? I'll tell you, there'd be a lot more. And that's so this po-faced reaction. This, this keep it in the closet. Let's not talk about it. Let's make young girls embarrassed when it first happens to them. If it was men that had periods, <laughs> oh, yes, then it would be a subject for after-dinner conversation. <laughs> It was a marvellous sunny day. I remember it well. A really terrific day. I just strolled out from the pavilion to bed. And would you believe it? My period started. 
And I was wearing whites, and as a young man, we did laugh. Cos we have a laugh, don't we, us lads? We love laughing about our bodily functions, all piss-iced against the wall, all farted, Gandhi's revenge, nobody smoked, nobody walked behind me. Coo, I'd dump one in a ball, don't go in there for half an hour. Coo, you fear explosion. We love having a laugh about our bodily functions, don't we? We'd be having a laugh about our periods. Gold, dear, we was down a pub, me and Baz flipping funny. We started menstruating. Well, we've always menstruated simultaneously ever since we were kids, cos we're fucking good mates, all right? <laughs> Toilet. Never believe it. Some old machines broken. Had to go home with a couple of beer mats in our knickers. <laughs> yeah, we'd be having a laugh. We'd be boasting about it. Us lads would be boasting about the extent of our flow. Fuck me, I was bleeding last night. Know what I mean? <laughs> you bleeding? Bugger off me! I nearly fainted. Fainted? I had to have a blood transfusion. Piss off! <laughs> you should see the size of my pants. It's like sitting on a fucking brick. Piss off! <laughs> That's what it'd be like in men's periods. We'd have a week off every month. <laughs> the Pope would make it a sacrament of the church would be lighting candles to the blessed flow. <laughs> Instead, it's a secret. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, real pleasure to be here, especially on this big night. I always remember what Amnesty is about. We're standing for the new report on Tiananmen Square. It reminds us just how often and how much we must think about what all this is about. But right now, I've got to say goodbye. My name's Ben Elton. Thank you very much. Goodbye! I sit here. What? I sit here. What? I sit here. I'm saving that for my friend. <laughs> you know contraception? What? You know contraception? Yes. What is it then? Oh, God. You don't know anything, do you? Have you ever had it off or not? <laughs> not. Right, well, it's a good thing you asked me, cos I know about contraception. The first thing you need for contraception is a lot of towels. <laughs> and you go up to the parents' bedroom and you take off the oh, duvet. Towels. And you... you go up to the parents' bedroom. Yeah, parents' bedroom. <laughs> what are you doing? Sorry, no, go on. It's great. <laughs> what are you doing? No, it's gone. It's great. I'm it's trying to do it. I know exactly. A character. 12 year old girl. <laughs> it's like towels. It's just pathetic. It's pathetic. Gonna be a twelve-year-old girl, thirty-year-old woman. That's being kind. <laughs> well, go on, do it. It was great. We all were loving it. I thought it was a fantastic piece of acting. Oh, it was fantastic. Such a cruel cow. I am, aren't I? You don't know how humiliating no, that is. Do oh, you? is it? Oh God. God. Well, it's not a devil. Yeah, ha-ha, very funny. Ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. It ha, hurts, ha, you know, when you do that. Ha, 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 ha. You don't even know me, <sighs> do you, Saunders? You don't even realise that... <laughs> Inside Ugh. this body, there is a huge talent that's just bursting to get out. Oh, is... <laughs>
See, the thing is, that would never happen in real life, would it, then? <laughs> Maybe not in real life, no, Jennifer. But this is showbiz, babe. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Time to say goodbye. Goodbye. Now it's time to yield the sign. Oh, yield it, baby doll. <laughs> now it's the time to wander away until we meet again. Some sunny day. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. We're leaving you to life. Bye. 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 Bye.